Hello, everyone. This is Andrew Hipsey here, the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Excited to kick off a new perspective series. We have never done one on pedagogy. Uh, we are in, as you all know, the year of retention. Think about it. Students spend more time with instructors than any other role on campus. Therefore, we as instructors have the potential to have the highest impact on our students. This series, Perspectives from the Pedagogy, is an opportunity for us as instructors, faculty in the college to share with each other what we've tried and what has worked well. Also, maybe what we've tried and hasn't worked so well. But the idea is that we are continuously improving our pedagogy. Uh, delighted that Carolyn Spear is here with us today. She's on today's panel, but I'm hoping she'll come to many of the episodes um, because she's an expert on pedagogy. So um, a very important subpopulation of our instructors uh, and a subpopulation that when I do the analysis, they are, account for an enormous number of credit hours are our GTAs, our graduate teaching assistants. So today, uh, what we want to do is we want to, to talk about that particular level of instruction. We want to talk to each other. We want to talk to the graduate uh, students themselves and share on around the different departments who have the most credit hours when it comes to GTAs, what they found has worked best to create an instructional uh, model with GTAs that has the best impact on their students. So um, I have personally invited Colleen Pugh, the director, uh, the uh, Dean of the Graduate School to come. Um, she's here, I believe. And I just want to say, acknowledge you, Colleen. Thank you for coming. Her heart is all about training <laughs> our graduate students in every dimension, including instruction. And when she came here, that was her big mission. So I'm so glad she's here. Uh, I want to uh, introduce you to um, Brian Bolin, who will be moderating the panel. Uh, Brian Bolin was a very successful director of one of our largest departments in the college, uh, the School of Social Work. Um, I stole him away uh, to become the Associate Dean of Student Success. Uh, in that role, uh, he is very student-centered and he is encouraging us all to be student-centered. He's involved in curriculum changes. He's in, in, involved in conversations on pedagogy at every level. So I'd like to thank him for being here and I would like to hand things over to you, Brian. Okay. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. And I, I, I hope I was successful in what I did in the School of Social Work over uh, the 15 to 16 years I was there. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go around and ask the panel to introduce themselves first. Um, so I'm just going to go in in the order of the panelists that are listed on the, um, the screen. And so, Mark, would you mind introducing yourself and saying a little bit about what you do? I'm Mark Harrismith. Uh, I'm a, a senior educator in the Department of Mathematics, St Statistics, and Physics. Uh, I'm assistant to the chair, and part of a, a good part of my job is about uh, instruction, uh, helping GTAs, as well as our uh, lecturers and teaching professors and educators within the, the classroom, and trying to, for our larger credit hour courses. Uh, continue to be, you know, growing as teachers through all of our classes. Thank you, Mark. Um, Dar um, Darren? I'm Darren Dufresne. I'm the director of the writing program, uh, associate professor of English, and i um, been doing this for 18 years. Our students in English, our graduate students in English who are GTAs, they are direct instructors. So they have as many as uh, 30 students in a class and uh, they're all on their own. Thank you, Darren. Lisa. Hmm. I'm Lisa Parcell. I'm in the Elliott School of Communication. I'm the graduate coordinator and the director of our public speaking class. So public speaking is one of the required classes for all undergraduates. 
So I am in charge of them, of our graduate students, both from the academic, their own personal academic standpoint, and from the teaching standpoint for their GTA position. They each teach two sections of public speaking a semester. So they have about 40 to 50 students each semester. Thank you, Lisa. Colleen. Hi, I'm Colleen Scott, Assistant Educator and Spanish Language Coordinator in Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures. Uh, I've been in this role for nearly five years. I oversee the introductory level Spanish courses and mentor and train our GTAs who primarily teach um, our intra-level Spanish courses. Thank you. And Carolyn Spear. Hi, I'm Carolyn Spear. I'm the director of the Office of Instructional Resources, which is an office that um, supports instructors of any rank in a rank agnostic way. So one of the things that we do in our office is to support GTAs, um, both new and returning GTAs. Personally, I have, a, I'm kicking things in my own office, sorry about that. I have, um, a little over 30 years of experience in higher education. Um, I started my career as a member of the faculty at Friends University, and I do also teach at Wichita State as an adjunct um, each semester. So that is my background. Thank you, Carolyn. So as many of you know, um, we, each of us um, has graduated from probably large PhD programs where we too were at one time GTAs and, and as Lisa said, they train theirs and, and Darren said about 25 to 30 students in a class. My training was um, in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was sociology, so it was again, those large um, classes, my classes were 75 to 100. Uh, Hundred, sometimes 120 students in a class. Um, we had a different environment in teaching then. And so the challenges today, especially post pandemic and in the last 10 years have, have changed teaching. And so our students, our graduate students face um, different circumstances than we did when we were going through school. Like Helen said, 30 years ago, like myself and her, 20 years ago. And so what are these changes and challenges and how do you prepare your graduate students today to, you know, balance the challenges that they face? So I'll throw that out to the panel. And if any of the panelists would like to answer, how do you prepare your students to face these challenges? Well, I can jump in and get us started if you like. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> you're a first penguin. Um, this office works with the graduate school each semester. So in this fall semester and the spring semester to onboard do new GTAs and they receive a lot of training in that onboarding. There every semester, it seems like we fiddle with it a little bit, trying to shift things around because there's just so much training that everyone who's involved in it kind of worries that you know, about cognitive load and those things. <laughs> There's just so much. Um, but our office provides training for um, GTAs in preparing them to enter the classroom for the first time, whether that's an in-person classroom or an online classroom. We do work with them on um, things, uh, some classroom management, um, early classroom management kinds of um you know, sort of informal warnings, I guess, in some way, some, well, you could see this and this is what you could do, or you could see this and this is what you could do, that kind of thing, um, as well as some technical training. Um, and we also try to establish that early relationship with the GTAs that we work with so that they understand that from our perspective, we will never again ask them if they're a GTA that we, to from our the perspective of this office, they are now an instructor at Wichita State University, and they can unlock the full support of this office for that purpose. And um, so we usually have an ongoing relationship with a number of GTAs who turn to us 
regularly when they have questions that range from sort of social cultural questions um, or this happened and I'm not sure where I'm supposed to go to more specific technical kinds of questions. Um, and that's the sort of support that we offer on an ongoing basis to GTAs. Thank you, thank you, Carolyn. I didn't know that you offered them classroom management techniques, but that's something that we. That's create, a probably, huge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's we a huge all part of our that. training. Yeah. So, other panelists like to jump in on how do you help prepare your graduate students for the challenges that they're facing inside and outside the classroom today? Yeah. One of the things I, I I'll jump uh, jump in here. Carolyn's office also helps our GTAs with imposter syndrome. Um, this is one of the things that uh, I don't think has changed from since when I was a, a GTA. Uh, you'd asked originally, Brian, too, about things that have things are different. Um, you know what things are different for GTAs today. Uh, when I started teaching, we had a Thermofax machine where we had to make our copies. You know, and you would crank this machine, and and you can get like a, a high of ink from it. Um, but the technology has morphed so quickly um, and the students on the one hand come in and they're like digital native. So a lot of them are really comfortable with it, but when they have to train up um, and Carolyn's a big help with this, with things like Blackboard and other aspects of their, their teaching, there's just a lot more of that in the teaching, I think now than there used to be. Uh, the cost of education is also, um, I think a big change. And one of the ways that that plays out was when I was a GTA, I was actively encouraged to kind of chase students out of my classes by um, uh, some of my peers. They'd be like, just, just be a real hard ass the first day or so, scare some of them out, and then you want to have, have, have as many papers to grade. We're not in that kind of place anymore, right? You know, we, we, uh, we are very concerned with retention. We try to make sure that our GTAs understand why it's so crucial for them to retain uh, the students that we have. And I, uh, I'll just say one more thing. I think the dimensions of teaching have really broadened quite a bit. Um, our GTAs have have to know so many different corners of the university um, because there's so many different kinds of things. And I know we'll, we'll talk about some of this uh, a little bit later, but uh, things with like, you know, their, their students' emotional well-being uh, certainly comes to the forefront. Thank you, Darren. And yeah, I think um, was Colleen next or Lisa? Either one. Oh, yes, I was just going to add, um, we always have our, our fall workshop. Uh, it's the Friday before classes start, and it's usually after they've had all of their grad school <laughs> orientations. So I, uh, we understand when <laughs> Carolyn said cognitive overload. Um, it's it's a pretty much all day workshop, and we cover everything from protocol, classroom management, to day one activity, setting the pace, clear expectations. Uh, we do have a GTA handbook that's specific to our department. Um, this is not something I created. This was something that was created back in 2006 from my language coordinator, um, Alejandra Bonifacino, and um, she's from Portland State, and they had a great language program that worked, so we, we adapted that model for our department. Um, so we go over everything from protocol to making sure students are in the correct level. Um, that's very important for our GTAs, especially uh, the ones that have not taught before. Um, we have students coming in without any prior language experience. Um, they are true beginners. Um, we have false beginners <laughs> that end up in Spanish one. Um, so they really have to, to gauge the level of, of the students that first week. Um, we go over the standardized syllabus. We all have a standardized syllabus for Spanish 111, 112, and 210. Um, we have a calendar um, that we follow. Uh, I create that for them. We have standardized tests. We have a block final. We have a standard amount of homework. Um, I even receive usage reports from our digital platform that shows me not just the quantity of homework that each GTA assigns, but the quality of the homework. There's, um, there's a graphic that shows, okay, this percentage is receptive language, this percentage is productive language, so we can really analyze um, you know, what, what the students are doing, not just in class, but outside of class. Um, and we talk about how to grade, how to grade <laughs> fairly inconsistently. Um, 
We go over how to set up um, their Blackboard course. We use weighted grades um, in intro Spanish. Uh, so they have to learn the, the LMS. Um, how to communicate with students via email. And also we show our students how they should email us. <laughs> um, so lots of, lots of different skills, um, not just teaching language. Well, that's, that's quite in depth. That sounds in my, my um, under or my PhD program, we had teaching seminars and we didn't do half of that in those teaching seminars for the GTS of that's amazing. Lisa, would you like to sure. chime in? We require all of our GTAs to take a two week pre session in the fall semester before they start, where we just concentrate on how they're going to teach the class. So they walk through everything from the handbook to the textbook. We have an online textbook to practice grading, the homework. Everybody has a shared syllabus, everybody has a shared assignment, shared test bank, shared to all the same standardized across the Board. But I think that the thing I really wanted to focus on is that we spend a lot of time talking about our audience, and this is a very, it's a very calm thing, but we think of the students as an audience. So we spend a lot of time talking about who these students are. When I was a, a GTA many, many moons ago, they were almost all second generation. They were almost all mom and dad were paying for it. They had maybe a part-time job and the prepared level was very consistent across the board. Everybody was prepared about the same amount as they walked in the door. We know that that's not the case for our students. Many of them are first generation. Many of them come from very, very diverse backgrounds and they're all at different levels. And so we take it as our, our challenge is to make them comfortable in being in college. So teaching public speaking is the skill set that they're going to gain while they're in our class, but we make sure the GTAs understand that the goal is to make them comfortable and competent and confident that they can succeed in college. So we spend a lot of time talk about, talking about mentoring. We spend a lot of time talking about having a lot of grace because the students come to you with various problems and issues you're the front line. We spend a lot of time talking about all the resources on campus that they can direct students to to help them. But again, the, the overriding message is audience. Who are our students? Where do they come from? What do they bring to the table? And what can we do to help them feel confident enough to make it to the next semester? Thank you, Lisa. That's, that's amazing that um, your program does so much working with graduate students. I, I know that in my, my PhD program, it was at the beginning of when we were looking at teaching and how to teach more effectively. And I think we've come so far in the last 30 years. And Mark, did you have something to add? For our department, instead of having a two week pre-session, we have a one week, the week before classes start, we come uh, do similar, we take advantage of ARC and you know the resources that they provide as well as having some specific times that are dedicated to instruction of algebra, you know, what does this look like as well as what you would expect in the class. And uh, for the algebra courses and our algebra instructors is also to kind of let them know if we have somebody coming into the PhD program from a master's program, a lot of times they'll be coming in not understanding that they are going to be the educator of this class, that this is their class and they don't have another lecture and they're just having a breakout group it's like that these are their students and these are the people that they're going to shepherd through this semester and to make them understand you know that and the resources available uh, for algebra specifically we have uh, you know the homework the exams uh, standardized final you know that is much you know the calendaring is much more lockstep uh, some of the other courses get to be uh, having some freedom for them to develop where they are. And as we assign it, hopefully, you know, uh, having them understand what they have. Part of that week is also to let them know to develop a teaching philosophy and that they're all supposed to share their teaching philosophy in the first day of class. So that the students, as they're teaching them, that they're all on the same page. It's like, why are you doing this? Why do you explain this way? And that the students understand who they're instructor is in front of the room and why they would have a particular style. And then also with beginning mentorship, 
um, to have one of the teaching uh, professors or educators paired off with the GTAs and to let them know they'll be evaluating them during the semester. And for this semester, the first time we're going both ways, uh, we're, we'll, we're doing like in-person evaluation for our teachers and inviting GTAs as part of that. If, uh, if one of our teachers is willing to say, not only have other teachers like come in and evaluate like one educator evaluate my class and then sit down and, and talk to me, but also have the GTAs as part of that to sit there and see what it looks like to have peers, you know, review each other and talk about what it means and how it's going and be open to that. And hopefully, and well, and continue that as we go forward and try to, you know, improve it as we do it. Um, and uh, the other would be to kind of continue it during the semester. We're also uh, adding teaching seminars uh, for this semester and encouraging GTAs to be part of that, possibly requiring that uh, in the future and to say that, you know, come in, let's talk about it, try to schedule times. And that's also the hard part. <laughs> they're students and they're teaching. So they have a 20 hour work week that they're being paid to to be a teacher and they've got a 40 hour work week of trying to accomplish their classes and how can we find times where they can you know be able to talk with one another and talk with other faculty about what it means to teach and try to keep that open so um, that's kind of our beginning in the beginning process uh, we also have a gta handbook and uh, trying to but that also includes not just responsibilities of teaching, that also includes responsibility of being a student. Thank you, Mark. And I think what this all demonstrates is how we're really dedicated to best practices in, in teaching and preparing our graduate students. Um, and all of you have different ways, but it seems like we're all very focused on best teaching and best teaching practices. Carolyn, I saw your hand up. Yes. So I mentioned cognitive load, then it came up again, and now we can hear why cognitive load might be an issue as we hear, well, we, we cover this and we cover this and we cover this and we cover things and they cover things. I did want to just share my screen briefly and give everybody an insider look into um, a Blackboard course. It's not something anyone has to enroll in. All GTAs are automatically put into this course that is... Um, um, created and maintained in partnership between this office and uh, the graduate school. So uh, Enrique right now is the, the person who's uh, putting a lot of the content in here and it's some of it's been in here for a while, but I just thought I would just show you what folks have access to so that they can come back to it when they at a point of need. Um, partly because I think you might be interested in it and partly because there's always room for more content in here if if folks want to have content put in here. So if you don't mind, I'll do it real quickly. Brian, is that okay with yeah, you? Yeah, that's fine because the next phase of questioning really is what resources are there on campus that oh, you use well. to, to help <laughs> um, train our graduate students and help support, like Darren alluded to, the emotional needs and they're trying to balance the work-life balance um, of teaching, taking classes and maybe working as well. So yeah. Go ahead and so, that would okay, be very so this will bridge us into that. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to share my screen real quickly then. Let's see here. So this is built in Ultra. Uh, people often don't know they're in Ultra. So if your course doesn't look like something like this, it's um, it's not an Ultra. This is an Ultra. Um, uh, if students, for example, in this particular instance, if students miss the in-person training um, and also there was some online training, that they needed to do this time around. It's all organized kind of at the top along with some call out materials that are just really important, um, including some training that this office provides on the American classroom culture. We've been providing that for about six years now. Um, it's recommended for GTAs that, who come to us from other um, um, classroom cultures. But we have an area, as you can see, on improving your teaching, um, Blackboard stuff, and then compliance kinds of things. For example, then in improving your teaching, we have a lot of information um, on various aspects of, of teaching, some technical, some sort of um, adaptive, I guess, um, skills, pedagogy kinds of training. Um, Blackboard, same thing. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of ways you can get Blackboard help and training access to that and rules and regulations. So this is um, 
a place that all GAs have access to and throughout the whole time, as soon as they become a GTA, even if they stop being a GTA, we don't necessarily even take them out of it unless they ask. Um, it's a great place also, a, a great way for us to reach them with messaging um, because only direct and indirect instruction GTAs are in that, in the group. Yeah, so those are wonderful resources. And I, I think any of us who teach could benefit from some of those resources in that just because they're- We're gonna be doing that. We're gonna be rolling that out in the fall for all instructors. It'll be a team rather than in Blackboard, but we are gonna be do, offering that starting in the fall. Yeah, there's always room for improvement. So I, I heard Darren allude to this. What are the other, we know our students are under a tremendous amount of stress and you know the challenges that face them are even greater than when we went to school and were, were students. So we have these technical resources to help them with their teaching, but what other resources do we have to, to help support them in other ways? that some of you are, are using here on campus? We work with disability services a lot, um, both for accommodations, but then also just for some like counseling on, on uh, how to handle things in the classroom. Um, diversity and inclusion has been really helpful for our GTAs. They, they run some, some uh, little scenarios uh, that we go through with our orientation with them um, to help them really understand who who those uh, students are and what they're kind of bringing into the classroom and try to see those things as strengths. And I think that's been really helpful. The veterans office, um, the uh, adult learning office, the library, graduate school, the wellness center, um, keep going on. Yeah, so does anybody else have other, other um, support services they use on campus to help with their graduate students? And we use the, um, the care team. Um, it, it feels like uh, at least every semester we have to fill out a, a report um, for um, a care team link um, for one reason or another to help a student. Um, so so this these times are much different than when we went to school and you were just handed a textbook and given some basic rules for, for teaching. Um, I'm going to move on to the next phase of questions. Um, so what are some of the ongoing ways? We've already heard about a few like common syllabi in MCLL, um, um, monthly meetings and teaching philosophies and, and peer review and teaching seminars. But what are the, some of the other ways we can you know, mentor, coach, support our graduate students to become um, better teaching, more effective in what they do in the classrooms. And so I'll just throw that out and... Yeah, let me add something that kind of ties the two together. Uh, this semester we launched a, an introductory slide, if you will, at the beginning of every presentation that students are going to give. And each of the slides focuses on one of those resources on campus. So the care team, the veterans, the adult learning. and before the semester started, we took all the graduate students and we we literally did a parade and went to every single place so that when they talked about those places, when they're presenting that material at the beginning of the slide, they could say, when you walk into the library and you go straight ahead, over on the right is the reference library. And they knew what that looked like. But that gives them, the GTAs, the confidence then to refer students to each of those places because they have literally been there and there's a slide that says, this is where it is, this is how to get there, there's a map, there's a picture of the building, but it gives them the confidence to then offer those support pieces to the students where before they were kind of, I know there's a place on campus that can help, but hang on a minute, let me go get my advisor and I'll figure out what that place is and I'll get back to you. And this sped it up immensely. And again, we don't expect everybody to remember each of these things, but they are on the PowerPoint presentations and they all have all of those on Blackboard so they can always go back to it and say, I remember sometime in October, they talked about blah, 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 and they get to it. Well, that's, that's a really cool thing that you're doing. Um, other, other, yes, Carolyn. One of the things that I try to do when I'm presenting to GTAs as a group, whether it's through the graduate school School events or other other things that throughout the year end up happening is I try to be 
very open and sort of metacognitive about what I'm doing in the room. So I, Mark talked about uh, having a teaching philosophy and talking about that on the first day. In, in live presentations each time, I try to do something similar. So I'm going to do this this way because research says this is better. I'm gonna talk to you about this or stop. Why would I have brought up this? You know, Why would I have asked you this question in this way? And I try to um, bring in that metacognitive aspect into the room when in real time so that they uh, are sitting there receiving information content but they're also seeing the how it's made um, in real time and I think that's helpful I have definitely had graduate students come up to me after presentations and thank me for that they seem to really like that kind of presentation so that's other other techniques and and um, ways in which we structure and set expectations for our graduate students? Uh, we have them observed to other classes. So in addition to being um, observed and evaluated by me and the, um, the grad coordinator, they have to observe other language classes, um, other 111, 112 classes. And even though they may be teaching Spanish, I always tell them, don't just <laughs> visit your friend's class. You can sit in on a French class or an Italian class or a Japanese class. Uh, you will be able to tell uh, if that methodology is working, if the teacher is effective. Um, and I remind them, you're not evaluating the person. You're just <laughs> observing them. And they have a, a, an observation checklist. And they notice everything from the explanations, the pacing, the speech model, the use of the target language. Um, how do you call on students? Is it random? Is there a specific order? Um, you know, the, the rapport between students and teachers or how are the questions handled? Do they have very specific things they have to look for? So they're supposed to do two observations um, and then they submit that, that observation checklist to me. Um, and most of them give me feedback and they let me know that, okay, that was very helpful. Now I know <laughs> what, what to look for in a language classroom. Very good. And, and then Mark? One of the things that, you know, you talked about how things have changed. You know, we are constantly talking about you need to teach the students you have and not the ones you wish you have. And, you know, just how much we've seen, uh, we have a, one of our adjunct lecturers who's taught for a very long time and also in high school teaches a, a preparatory math 012 and just in since 2020 has seen, he uses similar exams, has seen a 30% decline in ability of his students coming out of high school. And it's pretty consistent. And so, but the problem that we get into is sometimes we'll get together as teachers or mentors and we usually are responding to the bat. We talk a lot about negative and negative tries to, it tends to go really, really quickly. And there's a biological response of when you're walking and there's something unusual, you tend to stare at it because it's kind of fear response. But if it's fine and normal and good, you ignore it. And so we tend to ignore the good events in our classroom. We tend to not strongly focus on growing the good who all of our GTAs are. And to get to this point and to get into graduate school and want to be successful. And so part of that growing the good uh, within them and our students is much more in social credit and trying to grow these, the mentorships, giving them time to sit around and talk. And at times, like even today, where if we're talking and you notice the conversation is shifting into the negative, you shift it back into the positive. Where it's like, hey, what are the good students that you have? Because you can't get trapped in what sometimes feels like this is not going well for us. And it's like, no, we can deal with that. But what's also a positive thing that you have kind of try to dwell on that and use those you know, like mentorships is not just always, you know, a negative aspect, but also being positive and encouraging you know when they do well rather than at times having this problem of they're doing well i don't have to think about them i'm going to move on to the problem <laughs> which which we get caught up in and so we you know if we can foster those social events and those social times during the day so that outside of the classroom they're thinking more positively and you help them shape their feelings about a negative event in the class and how they interact with students, it can shape just how their lectures will go, how their interactions will go. 
and just kind of, you know, kind of up the, the emotional good as you do it. And I'll, like, I'll also positive for all the other services, care teams that are necessary. But a good part of this is, you know, encouraging them and letting others and everybody that you have that teaching is important and teaching has great value. They are also students and they're going to produce content and they're going to do research or, you know, create things, but to also understand that you create a positive event around the quality of instruction and, and then, you know, encourage it through, you know, good words or as many, like we also have a, a GTA award, you know, things of that nature where you can create something that they say, oh, you do value this and to let them know that and it helps just their day-to-day -day work. So, so I think what all of these examples are, are bringing us to is how can this be framed as a retention effort and a focus on how we mitigate some of the, um, the DF rates in some of these classes and really do focus on the good that these students are doing and the good that the training's doing and how can we you know, incorporate this into our, our university retention efforts because we are teaching in these classes a very large number of students who are first time in college and you know in their first years and it's really important for them to be successful and so how are we using all of these techniques to ensure that we will be retaining our students and and not having high df rates One of the things that we do when we work with GTAs at any time is to bring up the statistics. So um, I'm fond of saying this, I have them right in front of me, I can be super specific. In spring of 2023, 73% of all freshmen at Wichita State had at least one direct instruction GTA in the spring term. Um, it's, it overall instruct, er, Freshmen end up with about 70% of them end up with a GTA, direct instruction GTA, um, in fall and spring. Even seniors um, end up with GTAs somewhere around 15% of the time. It floats, it goes up to as high as 21 and down as low as it looks like 13. Um, but that's a lot. And that's something that we tell the GTAs all the time. You are being entrusted with these students. You are being entrusted with freshman students. You are, we trust you to do that. Um, rather than a message that could be more negative, I, I really like Mark's approach of talking about things in a positive way. You're in this position to, to help keep people in school, um, to do that. You know, <laughs> um, and I think that that's at least a message that moves them in that whether that moves the needle, I don't know. We don't have any research about that, but I do think that they hear it and they take it seriously and feel honored by that. Um, and so we, we repeat it a lot. Thank you. Uh, others have um, input. Yeah, Darren, go ahead. Our, um... Our, our GTAs are often closer in age to our students than like uh, some of the rest of us up here. And uh, we, we try to get them to really understand that and appreciate that and kind of lean in on that because I think our freshman students are more comfortable talking to GTAs and they, they sometimes talk about all kinds of things that involves like the care uh, uh, group and so forth. But one of the things that we do is we have all of our freshmen in these classes, uh, the first day of classes, they have to go up and sign a piece of paper on the GTA's office door that signifies that they know where that GTA lives on campus. And we try to really, really push the GTAs to make sure that they have um, that they're available for office hours and that they communicate to their students that that uh, they're they're not just like willing to meet with them, but that this is something that they want to do and it will help their writing and it will help their, their time as students up here. Because I, I think that holds a lot of our students back that they just won't reach out or they don't know that they need to reach out. Uh, and, and they often just ignore things like, like office hours that are pretty simple and can solve a lot of problems. So, so I, as many of you have been, been talking, I've heard many different ways in which you are 
using techniques to get towards consistency and syllabi consistency and how they do um, various activities. Um, is there a way that all of you use in which you try to get towards consistency of grading in classes? Yeah, absolutely. We have rubrics that are very detailed for every single speech that's given. And the GTAs are trained on how to do each of the rubrics. And we do examples in that pre-session class where we watch old speeches that we have permission to share. And they grade them and they talk about how they graded them. So it's, it's very, as consistent as we can make it. Nice. Uh, other, others have techniques that they use to develop consistency in grading? We, we do that too. We have a, a rubric that we use, a standardized rubric um, to, to grade. Um, and we've had workshops where we, we grade a writing sample in Spanish and we all come up with different, <laughs> different points. And then they have to justify, okay, why did you give it an eight? I gave it a six. Oh, you gave it a 10. <laughs> um, and then we, we come to a consensus. Um, the other thing uh, I tell them to do is, first of all, just be a model, be a model for your students. Uh, don't cancel class, period. Don't cancel class. <laughs> be there, be on time. Put your phones away. If it says in your syllabus, don't be on your phone, you know, don't you be on your phone. <laughs> Turn it off, put it away. Um, and look for red flags. You know, if you have students that are missing class those first two weeks, that's a red flag. So um, do a CS report, send an individual email. Um, send just a, a check-in email. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Are you okay? Um, just to make sure. And sometimes that'll bring them back to class. That's very nice, Colleen. Any, any other techniques of developing consistencies? So I, so I want- I, I want can just... address one thing real quick, Brian. Sure. It's small. Apparently. Um, we've used the, the power of our office to do what we can to pressure Blackboard into making some um, improvements in the way that grading can be done in that system. So not all GTAs by any means or all instructors use Blackboard to grade, but many do. And one of the, um, one of the changes that's coming in part because we have been just pushing for it for a while is the ability to grade across exams or other submissions by question so that instru instructors can grade all of question one, all of question two. Um, <laughs> and that is that is coming in August. So that is something that we will be providing a lot of training for GTAs in because they do do a lot of grading um, and that should help with the consistency of things. Excellent. I've uh, yes, whenever I grade um, open ended questions on Blackboard, it drives me nuts to actually have to go through each exam and grade this. And I eventually am developing a pattern, so I sometimes cut and paste um, some of those into a document, and then I'm cutting and pasting back and forth, so I, I'm as consistent as possible. So, one last question. I've sat here and listened to all of you, and I've I've actually learned some new things I'm going to try out when I teach. So how can we as professors who have been doing this for a long time benefit from some of these techniques and things you're teaching your graduate students? Um, how can we bring all of us to the table so we are practicing what is best and continually improving? I've heard things like teaching philosophies, peer review, observations in classrooms, consistent techniques of grading. Um, there's so many things that we can do. So how can we encourage others, especially, you know, we also have large numbers of um, adjunct faculty. How can we encourage others to continue to improve? Because I've learned something here today, many things that I'm gonna try out. These well, GTAs will become our, go ahead, be, was that Mark? Um, part of it is opportunity. Like one is everybody always take an opportunity. Like when you are talking with another faculty member to drop the importance of instruction, to, to do things like if they're shifting into the negative, ask them, hey, who's the best student you have? 
and having to email them or talk to them or how's that going or you know I always but use it in a way that like like for me you know when things are going well it's hard to focus on the things going well when you have a crisis right you, you always watch the burning building and not the one that's fine um, to use every opportunity like that uh, one I don't know if the, one of the things that hurt after many many years is there used to be a faculty lounge and the faculty lounge was removed because it wasn't fair to have a place where students couldn't go. Um, but to have a place where faculty, you know, come have lunches. I mean, when, you know, with COVID and everybody went away, we lost the natural opportunity to just talk because we are around each other. And we've tried to recreate that in some class situations with like online online systems for communication, whichever technique you want, but to actually have a place where, you know, you encourage faculty just to hang out and talk. And hopefully when you are there, if you're in a space like that, where you're talking with others, shift the words into positive and deal with the negatives, right? Actually, if they're bad, deal with it, fix it. But I don't know if we're going to have an entire building dedicated to the improvement of students and it'd be interesting to have a place where faculty would be like, hey, wander over there and here's a, a faculty lounge, but you have to walk through all the students to get there and see your students and talk to them and, and or something of that nature where it's like a place for you guys to talk or not. But, you know, any opportunity where try to make it natural and hopefully it'll, it kind of just kind of creates a good seed bed for you know, ideas to grow. Yeah, so what Mark's saying, I can give you an example of this. A few weeks ago, I, I was, I had a meeting, a committee meeting in the college and the meeting ended early and nobody left. We all just sat around and talked, talked about what was going on in our classes and our lives. And so what Mark is saying is we do need that community of support not just for graduate students, but for the rest of us who teach. And so it is an important point that you're making. Um, and we do need to find those ways to have community again. Yes, Carolyn. So I wanna just suggest two things. One, Mariah Beck is in this room right now and um, they, she's pivotal in running the uh, Teaching Matters seminars. And those are an opportunity for people to come together on a Friday they're, they're a long time so people can come in and out depending upon what their schedule is to just sit and talk with instructors across the university and GTAs do come to that, encouraging GTAs to come to that and also just come, um, I think is a, an opportunity that could be continued to be leveraged because it's a little bit under leveraged right now. Um, and then the other thing, a little bit of log rolling, and I'm sorry about that, but use the academic resources conference. We are, we will do whatever you want. If you want us to pull together people from across the university or within the college or whatever, and have panels or have sessions on certain topics or um, target particular groups of instructors or GPAs, um, we do that. We offer special things at night, um, different times. We often support, for example, like the TAP program in CAS. They'll ask us to do four nights of training on different topics. Um, so use that. That's not, it's not that I just sit there in my little castle and decide what we're going to have. I get a lot of input from folks and we try to always serve what people ask for. So I think that's another um, thing people can continue to utilize, but definitely those teaching matters seminars, just sitting around and chatting over some pizza about what's going on. Those have been really fruitful and enjoyable to attend. Um, so those would be what I would recommend. So I'm going to go ahead and open, thank you, Carolyn. And I'm gonna go ahead and open this up for audience questions at this point. Are there any questions from the audience for the panelists today? I was just wondering, I know some of you mentioned this, but I wondered if there was um, any protocols or things in place for um, departments to do assessments of their GTAs? Because it seems like something that we could kind of formalize more regularly. 
you know, we have a form that, you know, we work through for all of our GTAs and it's the same form that we're going to be utilizing also for our um, adjunct lecturers, uh, educators and teaching professors um, go through the, the exact same sequence. And uh, then yeah, the rule is you, you read it, you meet with the person before you're going to actually visit their classroom. You, you come up to, and this is borrowed from uh, a book that John Hammond was reading about, you know, you come to an agreement like understanding the person's teaching philosophy, understanding what they're going to be teaching, that you're on the same page about what's going to be happening in the classroom. So you're just not super confused in an evaluation that you have a good understanding that happens. Uh, the agreement that, you know, there, this is, you know, yes, there'll be a formal aspect of evaluation after, but the event itself, after you go in, you get then meet again with the teacher and you go through this sequence and, you know, answer those particular questions. But we have a form that we use uh, for this. And, you know, a big part of it is just simply allowing people to understand that they're there for the positive. You know, and if there are issues that the issues will be stated and these are like, and then you come up with actual, <laughs> it's like, what do you want me to do? All right, actual solutions to that. That's then part of the record. And then you can come back and revisit as it goes. Thank you. And maybe you could share with that with Mariah. Sure. Brian, uh, uh, Wilson has his hand up. Okay, Wilson. Right, I, I wanted to hook up with what Mark said about a, a place for faculty to come. And since, since Darren and I are probably the institutional memory here, I'll just remind everybody quickly that before there was SPTE, the, uh, the instrument was called LASTIC and it was actually the Liberal Arts and Sciences Teaching Improvement Committee. That was the acronym. And there used to be a place in Jardine, which was, I don't know, it was a teaching success center or something like that, but there used to be an actual space in Jardine Hall where uh, teachers came together and did this similar things to, to what Mariah is, is doing now. But I know, I know that one thing we do is we keep an eye on the SPTEs or whatever instrument they use. We keep an eye on that in, in our department, I know, and probably most of you do, just to make sure that the quality is there. But just to mention that there used to be a place was the LAS Teaching Improvement Committee, and they had a space where faculty came together and talked about teaching, similar to what Mariah is doing now. So that was before the Center for Teaching and Research Excellence? Maybe it became that at some point. Yeah. It, does and, that still exist, Brian? No, it does not. What happened was um, under Vandenberg, um, after Chuck Kober and after me and Robbie Pense, it merged into the student success into the Office of Faculty Development and Student Success, then it dropped the um, faculty development became just student success. So that all happened probably, I, I don't know, maybe 10 to 15 years ago when it yeah. ceased to exist. And so those pieces of faculty development have been picked up by other um, domains on campus. Other, other questions for um, the panel today. We do have a few more minutes in time for probably one more question. David Eichhorn has a question. Yes, David. Um, I just wanna circle back to uh, what Mark said about, about encouraging the positive aspects for the GTAs and ask what, uh, you, you did mention briefly GTA award, which is uh, seemingly the the most obvious way to do that, which we in chemistry have that as well, and I'm sure it exists in a lot of places. And just want to see what people's thoughts are on the utility of something like that and, and how to really uh, award those in a way that's meaningful and, or if there are other ways that can be used to acknowledge the GTAs for the work that they're doing. I, I do not know, David. Um, is there anyone that has thoughts on how we could begin a GTA award to just acknowledge and appreciate the good work and how I, I know how much they do sacrifice. I know that there are sacrifices our GTAs make um, so they can earn their graduate degrees and you know do good work with our students. 
how can we acknowledge them? So not an award, but we give away swag. <laughs> we give away <laughs> five five gigabyte by thumb drives, and if they need a cable um, for their classroom, our office will purchase it for GTAs, so they don't have to use their own money. We give. The math folks, the fancy chalk, as <laughs> they apparently the whole department now knows, um, dry erase markers, all of that kind of stuff, so that they don't have to purchase anything to go into a classroom and present. Um, we we try to provide them anything that they anything that they could need to do that for free. That is actually I said that we're we're agnostic as to rank, but actually that's a special benefit that we do for GTAs and. Um, the chalk, everybody gets the chalk, but <laughs> Good they to love know. that chalk. <laughs> well, my son so laughed that's at me this, we try this, to do. this last week because I was working on my laptop and I pulled out a thumb drive and he, he laughed at me. He said, oh, dad, you're using the thumb drive I used in junior high. <laughs> <laughs> So well, we try to, we try to, if you need a new one, Brian, you know a guy. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. I'm, I'm, it worked fine. So other, other things that we do um, or other thoughts or questions for the panelists? I suppose, I mean, in terms of reward, right? You know, obviously you have a monetary reward for like, an, you know, you know, a GTA of the year type of thing. But um, I, we could consider, you know, like, you know, researching, looking into like a lot of what happens with open source development, the idea of social value and social credit. There's a lot of things that we do in life because it actually has a good quality social value. So little things like, like you were talking about like gifts, if, if we would, you know, not just something that you buy or get, but something like you would make, or just those little things that you can do in a department. Like if you wanted an award for something that I did for uh, Dr. Friedman in terms of like open door, because like, you know, us being able to have our doors open and I have faculty and I always bugged them about it. It would be interesting to have such a, an award for any GTA or faculty who just like, you know what, I notice your doors open more than other people, you know, and make it a public announcement, just like, hey, you know, this is a something like may, maybe something I, you know, like make or say and let other people know, just like, yeah, that was, that's awesome. You know, those sorts of like social positives, <laughs> you know, that you would sit there and say, you know, you do see a graduate student who is visiting more often with the students. You, you make a point of saying it, you know, publicly and, and, you know, around other people and say, yeah, that's because it is, it's, it's a good and amazing thing. And but not just for them, but also for other faculty that you see, you know, you have young faculty who are meeting a little more often with others or have, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, there's a lot of people who want to work with you. Yeah. yeah, making it public. So today, um, a, a faculty member came by and was talking to me about an end of the year um, colloquium. And I, I told them that they probably should reframe it as maybe a spring celebration. I know many of our departments, history and some of the other departments have a spring ceremony where they um, honor students, hand out scholarships, say nice things about all the students and all the students have done. And I've seen that in about three different departments. And so there are ways in which, like as Mark is saying, it may not be a big monetary cost, but there are ways to acknowledge and appreciate the students and show them we do support them. So I'm gonna wrap this up today, unless Andrew wants to have any final words, but I'm gonna wrap this up by saying, I have gained knowledge about what I can do, where I can go, what resources I can use. And I've been doing this 30 years plus like Carolyn. And so I think we all can improve and learn new things from each other um, on this journey of you know, quality teaching at Wichita State University. So I appreciate all of you that have been panelists today. And Andrew, would you like to, to say I a few would, words? I want to thank you, Brian, for excellent moderating and thank you, every panelist. And I really actually want uh, uh, Colleen Pugh in there and I can see she's got her camera on. Hi, Colleen, to maybe give us some final words. I said at the very beginning, she came in with the mission of training GTAs in all sorts of dimensions, including teaching. So Colleen, 
Do you have some words of wisdom to close us off with? And you're muted. Yep. No, I, I, it, this this has been a lot of fun. And I, I often think that um, just this whole point of uh, listening to people's perspective, it's uh, often it's just we we need reminders, right? And so this has been a really nice reminder of um, good practices to use and um, ways to incentivize. And I know none of us can do all of it, but uh, there's always at least one or two things that that we can take away from it. So appreciate your efforts and um, really enjoyed this. Thank you, Thanks. Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. And um, actually the last person will probably be Cheryl who can give us a teaser for what's happening this time next week. So next week, same time, same channel, same, same bat station, um, we'll be having a panelist talking about being an ally in the classroom. Jean Griffith will be the moderator. And um, we'll be focusing on, you know, sometimes students will make a statement or ask a question in class that's insensitive to their classmates, personal experiences. And the panelists will discuss how to address such issues uh, or such incidents in the classroom rather and include positive and neg negative examples. So that's next week, two o'clock. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank all of you who attended this today. And I'll look forward to seeing you or Jean will next time. So thank you. And thank you to all the panelists today.